now it's time for the only show that doesn't care about ratings, Witness Radio, with your host, Ryan Muniak. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Witness Radio, the only show that doesn't care about ratings because our sole purpose is to save souls. On purpose. Today is a very special episode. I am talking with Michael Potts, also known as X-Ray, a former member of the International Church of Christ. Now, some of you are probably thinking, why the big deal? What, what's so special about Michael? What's so special about the International Church of Christ? Well, uh, if you are not aware, the ICOC is a cult. And I'm sure some of you may be reaching to shut off the radio show right now because you think I'm a heretic or something. Please do not. Please hear the whole show. It's only a half hour. But please hear the whole show and then determine for yourself if we are right or if we are out of our minds. Michael, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Ryan, thank you very much. Yes, um, I am a former member of the International Churches of Christ. Um, I joined in the uh, fall of 1998. Um, if I'll probably explain some of the history here, but there was a very tumultuous time around the year 2002, 2003, uh, finally leaving the group um, on Halloween on October 2006. Uh, six months after that, uh, after wandering and finding a good church home and kind of untangling my mind and the things I learned, um, I surrendered to Jesus Christ on May 6, 2007. What actually drew you into the International Church of Christ? Uh, you, you've told me before that you had a, a Roman Catholic background, right? Oh uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, well let me start. With, let, let's start with that then. What caused you to leave the Roman Catholicism, and then to go into the International Church of Christ? Well, my uh, background in Roman Catholicism is kind of more, you know, kind of on the liberal end. Um, I spent a total of about 20 years in Roman Catholic schools, all the way from pretty much preschool through undergrad at the uh, University of Dayton. Um, it's kind of interesting. There wasn't. I didn't really get a ba solid background of the scriptures. Um, I didn't have the gospel continuously explained to me all the time. You know, I just thought, okay, just get up, go to work, go to church, go to school, be a good person. You know, have my God time once a week and have communion, and everything's good to go. Um, what was really interesting about my conversion to the ICOC was I was not in uh, Dayton, Ohio at the time. I was actually co-oping. Uh, working for IBM in uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, in Durham, the Raleigh Durham area, and um, I had a roommate there, and you know, I was kind of hanging out and just kind of feeling okay. Now I'm not in class, and now I'm doing work, and um, all of a sudden, you know, one of these days we have one of our three young ladies who live in our apartment complex in the same building who lived upstairs. Um, they invited us to, you know, one of their Bible studies and like, yeah, Bible study. No, I'm Roman Catholic and everything. I'm like, not really interested. Um, as later on, you know, they established a friendship with us, and you know, I'm being a single guy. You know, if women are talking to me, and it doesn't matter if they're a couple years older than me, you know, that okay, I'm going to pay attention. So they they were friendly and nice, and they invited us to this, and they're just some of their friends, and so you should come to church sometime. I'm like, okay. And, um, at that point in early October 1998, um, I was invited to the um, Triangle Church of Christ um, in Raleigh-Durham, um, which the ICOC congregations, that's one of the larger ones. And I think they had over, they had 1,000 people and maybe 800, 1,000, 1,200, I'm not exactly sure, but it was relatively huge. So I go, I meet a lot of people, and everybody's friendly and happy, and everyone's clapping and singing songs. Like, okay, this is not quite Roman Catholicism, but I understand it's okay because this is the southern United States. This is the way they do it in the south. So afterwards, one of their leaders, I didn't know at the time, but he said, hey, how about we do a Bible study? You want to, you want to know more about the Bible? I'm like, sure, sure thing. So that's when I started doing their Bible study series. Their Bible study series is known as First Principles and 
I, I got to kind of stop at this point and kind of back up and kind of give a definition of you know what is a cult here because a lot of people may not have may have different ideas of what a cult is. Um, the definition that I'm going to use uh, basically has three components. It's a group where you have at the top you have a either a charismatic single charismatic leader or a nexus of leaders that are tightly bound together. Um, You're listening to Witness Radio. Second component is you have a system of followers under that leader or group of leaders, and they have different roles and different aspects. You have people who just support the leaders. You have people who kind of enforce the rules. And then at the very bottom, the largest group is just a normal, plain, rank-and-file member. So you have, but the purpose of everyone in the second group is to support the leader. The leader's purpose is to, you know, have the people and the followers. The third aspect, and this is where first principles comes in, um, the cult has a system where they indoctrinate, well, capture, recruit, and indoctrinate new followers in the system that become new rank and file, plain Jane, ordinary members. Um, and the system they use in the in the uh, ICOC is a set of Bible study series, and I use that term Bible studies very loosely because it's twisted. Um, it's called First Principles. And typically in those sessions, which the technical the technical terminology for that is called thought reform, but you know, probably we would probably call it under its more well known name called its brainwashing, where it takes you step by step with some false logical premises that you don't know what the next step is, but the process goes from one study to the next study, and you accept more and more falsehood until the very end you're completely indoctrinated. The group here at the University of Cincinnati, they've been kicked off of campus at UC as far as I know at least twice. There was once in the early 1990s, and the other time was in 1999 when their organization name was known Campus Advance. Uh, they came back a couple of years ago, and in one sense it does make sense because it was after Kit McKean leaving um, and they pled their case, and they, they uh, were accepted now as a recognized campus organization under the name of Disciples on Campus. It's really interesting because this cycle seems to repeat itself over and over in the ICOC and the KIPP's uh, ICC. That, number one, the campus ministry, they come in, they become a recognized organization on campus. Then after that, they leverage, they make use of the campus's resources, such as facilities and advertising and they work the plan. They go out and recruit people. They do the thought reform studies with first principles. They convince people to join. They convert them. And then they start the discipling. And discipling is, gets progressively, because it's man-centered and man-driven, becomes more and more abusive. Now, at that point, the, the campus ministry typically, if it doesn't plateau at some level, it becomes a significantly large group. Typically, one or more converts eventually leave and they report their abuses to the campus authorities. At that time, the gig is up and the ICOC loses its campus affiliation and its benefits. And it kind of goes into this underground hiding state where they're kind of still on campus but not officially recognized. So that kind of takes a lot of, depending on the situation, it usually takes a lot of air out of their, uh, out of their uh, proverbial balloon. But after they low, lay low for a while, and sometimes they change their name, and sometimes they just change their leadership out to a new group of people, the cycle repeats itself, and they go back and get re-recognized on campus again. Well, the campus ministry in the ICOC is so critical to the entire system. It's basically, in a lot of senses, it's the engine because of the number of converts. It drives ICOC numerical growth. It also provides a lot of morale for everyone else because of the number of people being brought in the system. Uh, the large majority of the converts who didn't even grow up in the cult, you know, you'll find out that they were recruited and converted as campus students. Um, another important reason for the campus ministry, it provides another critical link to financial resources because college grads Hopefully the economy is getting better right now, but the, the college grads typically, obviously, they get better jobs, better jobs mean more money coming in, more money means more tithing, and remember in the ICOC and the ICC, tithing is mandatory, and there's some other things that are kind of mandatory, but it's kind of not, not in scope here. Um, but the campus ministry, not only for, it's not only important for financial resources, it's also very important for it provides a talent pool for leadership. And again, you look at current ICOC leadership, you'll find a lot of them to start out in the campus ministry. So having a campus ministry that's both growing numerically, in the ICOC kind of terminology, I call it cranking. So not only 
it's, it's not important because it's it's cranking, but it's all, on one hand growing, but also it needs to stay under the radar enough to avoid trouble because you go out and convert the wrong person or go out and be too aggressive, you know, that could show up on the radar and you can get in trouble with the, uh, the campus authorities. So it's kind of a balancing act at some point, even though in uh, most situations that we've seen it eventually in a lot of places it grows to the point numerically where they can't fly under the radar anymore. So this is why your work and work of other authentically genuine Christian ministers on uh, the college campuses is absolutely critical because it need, you need to avoid getting people... Number one, getting people involved in this organization, answering questions about why they do things that they do and why they teach things that they teach, but also for the people who are stuck in there and kind of questioning, you'll kind of give them a lifeline of grace out saying, hey, you've been deceived. They're not telling you the whole story. We can help straighten everything out and the questions and the abuses and the things that they've they've, uh, been teaching you. Ratings. We don't need no stupid ratings. You're listening to Witness Radio with Ryan Muriak. <coughs> but we like Ryan. <coughs> we do! Just go to witnesstalkradio.org. Hmm, okay. What are some red flags to look for when talking with people that... Things that might tip you off that they're an international Church of Christ follower? Um, Probably the only thing externally would be you would see a group of people and most of the time they would be racially integrated Um, and not necessarily, but most of the time they, a lot, well, a lot of the time, at least a lot of the time they would be. Um, You would see them hugging each other, kind of side hugging each other, especially the guys. One on one, you know, you would encounter them and they'd be very friendly. And obviously, they would try and ask you, you know, you go to church anywhere? Would you like to come to our Bible study? Uh, for the guys, they'd be like, hey, you want to go out and play football or shoot some hoops or something? They would be pretty much unassuming at that point. What about uh, like uh, keywords or anything? Like when you're talking with someone, what are what, what would be some keywords? Probably the most common one would be referring to each other as uh, brother and sister or bro and sis. Uh, a lot of their terminology, uh, probably the kingdom or talking about, oh, so-and-so got baptized. Yay, how long have you been? Dis-? They would throw the term around disciple instead of Christian. So, oh, I've been disciple for a couple of years. Oh, he's a disciple out in here. So now how can we reach people who are in this cult, in the International Church of Christ? How can we reach them for the real Jesus Christ. It's really difficult because it would be, again, you would have to use a similar line of thought with the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or another major cult. Um, You would have to bypass all of their kind of mental booby traps they have set out around them and kind of force them to kind of make them think, literally think outside the box. One of the issues that we've, had uh, with the ICOC, and this is something that we've, that me and uh, Chris Lee, um, a couple of other people who have uh, been uh, former members for a couple of years, there's no, there hasn't really been a really defined theology to counter what the ICOC teaches, because on the surface you see, okay, these guys are legalistic, these guys require water baptism to be saved. And that's pretty much it. But the thing is, the ICOC sets up making disciples and baptizing people as their ultimate idol. And what happens when you attack someone's idol? They are not happy at all. And they're going to defend that tooth and nail, tooth and claw, no matter what you try and do. So you can't go around baptism, but I believe we worked out a couple of ways where we can uh, circumvent that and go to the foundation of the theology. And I think I've kind of hinted at couple of these already. Okay, let's go over them. Okay, the primary one is that the ICOC does not, at worst, teaches, and this is true for the International Christian Churches too, Kip McKean's new group. They teach that the Holy Spirit is at worst merely a seal of one's salvation, or at best the Holy Spirit is a powerful but impersonal force. Okay, that sounds like the Jehovah Witnesses. Pretty much. 
Now, the thing is, with a normal Christian life, we're dwelt with the Holy Spirit, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're convicted of our sin by the Holy Spirit, and we're all guided by the Holy Spirit. So, Right, the co-equal, co-eternal, third part of the Trinitarian Godhead. So we not only have that, but we also, within the church, not only individual congregations, but Church Universal, we also have, we're also connected and have accountability with one another. Because that type of discipling is good and healthy. Now, again, what happens in the authoritarian discipling pyramids, not just the ICOC, but some of these other groups I mentioned earlier, what happens is the Holy Spirit loses his job. The discipling hierarchy takes care of empowering, encouraging, convicting of sin, all the roles of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the things that for the six months between leaving the ICOC and finally becoming a, a genuine Christian is making that final connection of, oh, I got the Holy Spirit totally wrong here. And part of that was just finding a healthy church and being there long enough to actually see normal, healthy Christians doing normal, healthy Christian things and hearing sermons that actually mean something. <laughs> and uh, some teaching of the Holy Spirit, too. So, as, as you've pointed out, and kind of implicitly pointed out, this, this, the ICOC does not believe the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, the ICOC is inherently non-Trinitarian. Not Trinitarian is not good. Right. That's that's definitely cultic. Yeah. That's that's heresy. Right. Right. And this is this is one of the things where if we look at the dividing line between the legalistic churches of Christ and the ICOC, where the discipling pyramid pushed some things that were toxic or questionable, just pushed them over the edge of heresy. The second thing, this might be a little bit more difficult to find, is but not too much if you do the, the cross study, is that they believe that Jesus is fully human in nature, but they don't believe that Jesus is fully divine in nature. Say what? Yeah, if you go through the cross study, it's like, okay, Jesus surrenders to the Father of Garden Gethsemane, and he's a punching bag for the rest of the time. Where, in reality, it says that the Father has given me the authority to lay down my life and pick it up again. So even though it looks like Jesus is getting punched around and he's having his unfair trial and he's getting flogged and he's being crucified and spat upon and all that, he is still divinely, sovereignly in control and he's not giving up his life until... Until he's ready for it. Right. On God's terms. Right. On the will of God the Father. And there's other places where you hear, you know, Jesus and God did this and Jesus and God did this, but it's kind of like you're kind of confusing... God, you're not really talking about the Father and the Son. It, it gets really muddled. So it's kind of like the ICOC Trinity effectively becomes, okay, you have God the Father, and he's God, and then you have Jesus, and he's kind of God, and then the Holy Spirit, he's he's it. Hmm. So it's not a Trinitarian. It's a one and a half a Tarian or something. Gotcha. <laughs> kind of odd. Um Okay, so that's number two. And again, that says, okay, ICOC is not Trinitarian. Uh, the third one, um, talking about uh, the nature of sin. Um, if you ever heard of an old heretic called Pelagius, um, the ICOC is very, very anti-Calvinistic. They're not even Arminian because the, the, the mainline Church of Christ are typically Arminian. Um, but a lot of the unhealthy ones kind of tend toward Pelagianism. The ICOC is completely Pelagianism. Okay, and what is Pelagianism uh, for those who don't know what that term means? Right. Okay, where they deny that people are born with a sinful nature, that basically people are born morally neutral, and through being taught, you can theoretically achieve a state of sinful of sinless perfection. Okay, so that's kind of like the Seventh-day Adventists. They believe in sinless perfection. Again, the ICOC, and this is where the discipling hierarchy comes in, because how do you, that's the goal of sin, is stop sinning. Sin is just the list of things you did on the piece of paper. It's not your nature. It's not who you are. You're listening to When This Radio. Mm -hmm. Would you say that they uh, do not believe that uh, Jesus Christ died for their sins, past, present, and future? Um, I believe on paper they would say that, but in practicality that wouldn't be true. Okay. Because here's 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 another way to kind of look, look at some of the stuff when it comes to salvation theology. When 
you know, Jesus expects, you know, Jesus expects us to, you know, repent of our sins. Jesus expects us to put our faith in Him. And I know, kind of, I'm gonna kind of lop this in. Could be controversial, but Jesus, you know, kind of the normative Christian process is for us to be, after we do those things, you know, kind of don't wait too long, but also get get baptized. Now, the question is, is it possible for us to even put our faith into Christ perfectly? And the answer is no, because, you know, we can't, you know, even right now there are going to be times where, you know, we're, we're faithless or we don't completely trust, trust God. But, you know, there's a level of sufficiency and there's a level of perfection. The ICOC defends and builds everything around this impossible level of perfection that even themselves don't even fit. And then we see that in the sin study with repentance, because, okay, we repent of our sins, but, again, you can do the sin list and write down every little naughty thing, a naughty thought you've ever had in your life, and that was even possible, and that's still not going to be enough. That's not perfect. And then when it comes to baptism, you know, I probably would say that, you know, baptism is a normative part of a Christian process. You know, there's always going to be exceptions. There's going to be people who are who die before they get a chance to, to be baptized and things like that. But for the rest of us, the majority of Christians, you know, baptism is a normal thing. You know, Jesus expects it. Go out, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And out of the three, baptism is the one that we get the one messed up the most. <laughs> so, again, the only restriction on baptism from the Christian perspective would be, you know, if we're not talking about infant baptism, would be, you know, if someone places their faith in Christ, repents of their sin, you know, they're ready to get baptized. And that's pretty much it. And probably from practical perspective, probably just, you know, not wait forever, you know, go ahead and do it as soon as you can, you know. Right. Show that show that what Christ has done for you, that you have been buried with him, and your sins have been buried with him, and you've been raised back to life. Right. And biblical Christianity, you know, it says that uh, baptism is is a good thing baptism is a a command of god uh for those who have been saved but it is not a requirement to be saved and that's the right. big difference right because the argument and this goes back to the mainline church of christ the legalistic ones they would say that baptism is ne they would ask the question is baptism necessary for salvation and the obvious answer is no mm -hmm. i think the more correct word that well the correct word that starts with N for that would be would be is it normative in the salvation process and for that it's like you know that's absolutely true because I know even in your things you're probably gonna maybe hopefully run into someone someday you know you you just shared the gospel with them and they repent and you're walking along and, and, and the guy says hey what here's this fountain full of coins here at the mall why shouldn't I be baptized right <laughs> it happened with the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch so mm -hmm. There you go. Right. Um, but if someone isn't baptized, you know, right away or isn't baptized, it has no bearing on their salvation. No. Because God handled, because the most important thing is placing your faith in Christ. God does all the work. Well, Michael, thank you again so much for being on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Michael Potts, also known as X-Ray a uh, person who used to be in the International Church of Christ came out of it uh, and now uh, speaks out against it because it is a cult that uh, teaches many false teachings, uh, does a lot of brainwashing or or mind manipulation. Michael Thought reform. Thought reform, yes. So, Michael, is there a, a website or anything that uh, you want to... Uh, plug for people to get more information about you, about your ministry, or just about the International Church of Christ and their heresies? Uh, the big one would be uh, reveal.org, www.reveal.org. Um, that's the website set up in the uh, 1990s. There's been some new information added to it. It kind of wound down around 2003, but it was kind of winding back up because of not only Kit McKean's new group, but uh, some of the resurgent practices in the ICOC. I know, kind of a side note, um, at the university, at the uh, Society Church of Christ here in town, according to their main leader at the end of uh, August of this year, 
they have about, he said there was, what was it, over 80 people in their campus ministry and 65 at UC. They're becoming a force again. They've been up to maybe 100 people at certain points. Um, there were stories where at Miami University in 1983, they baptized how many people? I think it was over 100 people, and it caused a, a giant tizzy up there. Um, even though I don't think they have a lot of people at Miami. That's another sad thing about that because they focus so much on the conversion that, you know, once you do that, you're done. Mm. You don't really, really, really want to kind of pour into you, you know, what you need. Mm -hmm. um, kind of ignored. You're at that point, you either start getting on the discipleship train and converting people and working your way up the pyramid, or you're just kind of hanging out, and eventually you're just going to fall off the wagon. Gotcha. Okay, so reveal.org. Uh, now, that's not your website. That That's just a general uh, website for information. Oh uh, yeah, that's a general website and it has links to other things on there. Okay, and anything specific for for you website or anywhere that uh, in case someone has a question for you, a way to contact you. Right, I have an email address: xray three four two radio at gmail dot com, um, xray three four two radio dot blogspot dot com, and on Twitter at xray three four two radio. Okay, well again, thank you, Michael for being on the show and for helping to inform the listeners about the cultic practices of the International Church of Christ and even the uh, International Christian Churches, which is Kip McKean's new new branch off right. of this cult. Right, and, and kind, of keep it, kind of keep this in perspective. Right now the ICOC is probably... Uh, December 2014, it's probably a, at least 93,000. They could be 94,000, somewhere in that range. Uh, Kit McKean's new group is about 3,000, and they have about... Let, let me double-check that figure real quick. Yeah, they have about 3,000 members, and 12,000 of... Uh, 12, 1,200 of the 3,000 are in uh, Kip's new hub church in Los Angeles. Um, they're not here in Cincinnati. The closest... ICC Church is in Chicago. Um, for some of us who kind of keep our eyes on this, there hasn't been. Kip usually lets us know in advance, kind of posts online what church is and where he's going to head next. Um, so we're kind of safe here in Cincinnati for now, but the Cincinnati Church of Christ and the ICOC, the disciples on campus, we need to be aware. I've already received um, one email this year from a freshman, and they came in from out of town, and they were encountered at ICOC, and then they started digging around and saying, you know what, this doesn't, this doesn't jive. There's something wrong with these guys, and they found our materials, and he um, contacted me and thanked me for uh, so one of the papers I wrote. Wonderful. I'm I'm glad to hear that he was able to find that, and uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, with with me. Uh, being with Christian Collegiate Network on the campus. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, help the more students on the campus, uh, leading them away from the cult that is trying so hard to to uh, reach them, uh, not to save their souls, but to just to increase their numbers and, and uh, try to make themselves good with God, which none of us can do. Right. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this uh, show has been informative and educational. I pray that you can use some of the information that was presented here today. And until next time, the fields are ripe for the harvest. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and share your faith. May God bless you.
Mutinous Radio has been brought to you by the Muniac family.